All right, so with uh, verses 12 and 13 there, um, as we've mentioned before, John uses a lot of um, very colorful imagery to try to capture the meaning that he's being delivered here. Um, in uh, these, these great and terrible creatures that get described, natural objects like the sun, the moon, and the stars being completely upheaved out of their, their normal functionality. Um, in understanding the context, one of the great, um, one of the, uh, the most important things that we need to keep in mind is that there is something called historical or cultural context. I believe I've mentioned it before on a Sunday morning or in a, a study. Um, in, what, in the midweek message videos that I do on, on Facebook, I know for sure that I've mentioned it there. But cultural context is important because it gives us an idea on what John is being influenced by as he uses the words that he does. Um, the symbolic meaning that John himself would have been familiar with, in other words. We do want to remain as literal as possible, but what cultural context does is it says that there are images that we become familiar with. So maybe we talk in our modern day context about the land of the free, the home of the brave, the land where the bald eagle is, you know, and it, it symbolizes what? It symbolizes America, right? That's what we're talking about. When I talk about the land of, you know, of freedom, um, I'm not talking about the, just the idea of freedom, I'm talking about America, I'm talking about the United States. So here, I think that we've got something very similar in the cultural um, context, the understanding of what John's talking about. Most scholarly commentaries are in agreement that John's words are alluding to empires, nations, and kings here on earth. Now, why is this the case? Because the symbolism used was symbolism familiar, kind of like the, the bald eagle in America, that example. Symbol, uh, symbolism used by John that was familiar with um, the people that he was associated with, the people that he uh, spent his days around. Um, for example, the sun was symbolic of the great pagan Roman Empire. This vast, expansive power on earth is now, according to John, turned black like sackcloth. And essentially what we're looking for in understanding this and looking at it here is we are looking for the fall of a, a great empire, a nation. Now, the Roman Empire, as we understand it today, um, is no more. It doesn't exist anymore. There's... Italy is its own standalone nation now, um, and that, that's, kind of, that's kind of it. Um, but there are alliances that exist that include Italy, of course, so like NATO, the European Union, uh, that do involve that nation. It's entirely possible that another nation arises, kind of like another Roman Empire style, maybe through Italy or in, it, with Italy, in the future um, that doesn't exist yet um, that would uh, end up fulfilling this prophecy but this is essentially what this is talking about is the the, the sun turned black like sackcloth is the fall of whatever this great empire of a nation is um, is supposed to be so um, some have said that and, and, and speculation that maybe it's the United States the, the problem, I think, with that is that the, the United States doesn't fit the idea of a, of a Roman Empire equivalent nation. Um, the Roman Empire was the dominant, number one influence in the world that kind of had sole control over everything going on. Um, so I would, I would more so be looking, I guess, um, for something like the United Nations on overdrive, like some, the United Nations or something like that, looking uh, for control over all global trade, over all global politics, over something like that. We have something like that. That would be more along the lines of an equivalent comparison between the sun falling and John's uh, perspective here. So um, personally, I don't quite think that, th I think it's going to be an alliance that forms still yet to come in the future. I don't think that it's talking about any existing nation yet. Um, for question one here on your worksheet, um, you can either put the, the, the Roman Empire or a great empire, um, just understanding that, you know, the, the old Roman Empire of John's time is long gone. That fell long time ago, around um, 
Oh, uh, well, with the fall of Constantinople, historically, that was kind of, I guess, the downfall. And then the Holy Roman Empire split up, and it became the early kind of nations that formed Europe. And, like, the, um, well, I'm not going to get it. That's, that's a whole rabbit trail. Let's not go down there. Um, but anyway, the, the, the nation groups that kind of formed um, the early part of, of the European nations that we see today. And, of course, the world wars and everything split things up a little bit more. The Yugos, um, Yugoslavic uh, area broke up into a couple of nations itself. So um, all with this big cause-effect relationship. But essentially, you're looking for the sun, this, this alliance empire, to be the center of it all in earthly politics. So its downfall, according to John, is going to be monumental. Um, again, with that being said, my personal view is that this, this sun, this nation that's being predicted here and prophesied is not quite here. Um, I think that we will get to a point where that something like that will exist, and then when that happens, then, okay, this sun will, will fall. All right. Verses 12 and 13, the whole moon turned blood red and the stars fell to the sky. Boy, you better hope John is being figurative here, right? Um, stars are massive entities. These, these big, I mean, they're, they're huge. They're far bigger in scale and size than the earth. So if, it's, if he's talking literally that, you know, a star is going to fall on earth, that's going to be the end of the planet. Like if a star were to hit the earth, we're gone. <laughs> that's the end of it. Um, so I don't think, because it, it the story continues well after that, I don't think that, of course, with that being said, that he's being literal about stars falling to the sky. Instead, kind of what we talk about here, um, or you know, something symbolic here that he's trying to, uh, to reference. Um, there is some scholarly points to be made that the moon turning red could be meant to convey that the empires of this time, so falling, uh, the, the fall of the Sun Empire, um, and then you've got these, things, these events that are happening around that time, um, that the moon turning red could be meant to convey that the empires this, at the, of this time are bloodied and desecrated. Um, and to be honest, I, I, don't, I don't see a, a whole lot of um, support beyond kind of the, the sun, what we've kind of talked about there. Um, the, the, the moon and the stars there, it's, um, I think there's something else going on, and I think that you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about here in a minute. Um, what I think is going on is that he's kind of reemphasizing the same point through um, referencing an Old Testament passage here. In Joel chapter 2, verses 10 through 11, it says this, and you'll see some very similar imagery again pop up, the same imagery that we uh, see in Revelation. The sun and moon grow dark, the stars diminish their brightness, for the day of the Lord is great and terrible, who can endure it? That's from Joel, the uh, minor prophet section way back in the Old Testament. John here is again using familiar language to try to say, okay, well everybody's familiar with the book of Joel, what he's talking about here, and here's this vision, this, this prophetic um, happening that's going to be happening. Um, so he's using imagery to kind of reconvey that same point that they would be familiar with. So while there's this cultural support for the idea that the sun becoming black is representative of political empires and earthly powers being destroyed, the rest here, the moon and the stars, is alluding to the same imagery that we see in the book of Joel to reinforce the extreme nature of this political upheaval. So again, kind of uh, rehashing the same point and in, um, in using a scripture that uh, his readers would have been familiar with. Okay. So, with that being said, will you know, will the sun or will the moon literally turn uh, blood red? I, uh, I'm not keen on that myself. I, I think it's you know referencing Old Testament imagery here to emphasize the tumultuous um, upheaval of the, the the political scene and everything that people would be comfortable with at the time. The stability that they would have been uh, familiar with is kind of done at that point, right? So that's. Um, I think that's that's what um, he's talking about here. All right, the heavens receded like a scroll. Verse fourteen: The heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Again, man, I hope he is being figurative here, and it's not quite literal. Um, again, that would 
Um, to, to have something like that happen in a literal fashion would kill everybody on the planet. Um, but with that being said, this is a bit of a challenging and unclear verse right here. Um, but what we do know is that the Jews and the Christians, to the Jews and the Christians, the heavens usually indicated the domain of God and the angelic hosts. So it seems that the heavens being receded and rolled up like a scroll, that what the imagery here is and the language is trying to convey is that heaven is refusing to turn its ear to the cries of the ungodly at this point and to those being judged. We've if essentially, to understand this, I think the best way to look at it is that we've reached a tipping point. And there's no going back. This is, this is it. And so to speak, God makes every effort, um, as we discussed, to remind us that he's with us, even to the end of the age, to use Jesus' own words. But we should also be reminded that when Jesus was speaking those words, he was speaking them to his followers, right? So when we reach this point where it's, it's everything is being upheaved and just turned upside down, the heavens receded like a scroll. Heavens shut off the lines of communication. Now we're, we're, we're kind of done at this point. Every mountain and island is removed from its place. Um, essentially, you know, everything that we're familiar with is now almost unrecognizable. So in this receiving, this pulling back by heaven, even more so cements us in the end of the age for the earthly powers and political domains of the time. And so when you think about that and, and kind of following that, that sun imagery where this, this massive alliance, this power, you don't get to that point very easily. You know, men throughout the ages and throughout history have sought to control and dominate the world. Something is going to come along to unite them all. And to actually make that happen so much so that it'll be on a scale that we've never seen before we've seen great empires the mongolian empire we've had the roman empire um, the byzantine empire we've had all of these nations that have been in control of sizable chunks of the world but i think what this is talking about here is the world itself it's some some sort of an alliance that grips everyone and probably not by force everything revolves around the sun and our solar system because it works. And so with the fall of this nation being alluded to as the sun, um, I think that people are, and nations are going to because they feel that there's safety in it and you know what, maybe we can get rich off of it or something to that effect. And so it's not, a, um, it's not something that necessarily happens by force. The empires of old, they came about by force, by conquering or by you know political kind of um, backdoor dealings and stuff like that, but um, I think that this is going to be different. So for all of this now to be completely up, upheaved and, and changed um, is God's way of saying, no, it's not actually humanity that's in control, it's man. All right, verse 15, and uh, we're going to go 15 through 16. Then the king, and this is to reiterate my point here. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can withstand it? Um, I've kind of got in mind here um, Tower of Babel. Everybody coming together for their own purposes. God says, I want you to spread out. You're supposed to go and subdue the land. No, we're not going to do that. We're going to do the very opposite. We're going to sit put right here. We're going to build a tower to our own glory for our own purposes. And we're going to do this. And God says, okay, I, I can't tolerate it. <laughs> you're supposed to be doing something. You're being ordered to go about, and you're not doing it here. At this point, the, the Tower of Babel, so to speak, of these people's lives, of the building their own, like, this is how we want to do things. It's our lives. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're in charge, not God. You know, we're going to build our own empire that's going to, you know, rule the, the world. Um, so we... Uh, we really see, I think, here um, um, kind of a reminder of Joel 2, both this, this talk about judgment and similar language. Who can endure it? Who can withstand it? Um, you see that in the end here, verse 17, and then kind of go back to, uh, to Joel. 
Um, and he uses similar language. Who can endure it? It's, it's just, you know, there's, there's no escape from it. The wrath of the Lord is final. And um, it doesn't, all the power and the, you know, how much they thought they were in control of things is now no more. So it's kind of a, it's a, a strange realization that they kind of come to that point after all of this pride and being um, cemented in what they, um, what they believe. So um, the second question here on your, your worksheet, verses 12, uh, 12 and 13 use powerful imagery also found in which Old Testament book? The book of Joel. The imagery is also pretty uh, straightforward here. Notice that it encapsulates everyone, the rich and the poor, the powerful and the servants and the slaves. Uh, nobody is, um, is spared just because they, um, they have a couple extra bucks in their pocket, and um, it's, it's um, a level playing field for everybody here. It's, it's irregardless of wherever they find themselves in the social ladders of the time, everybody is on, um, is on the same playing field of judgment. Um, all their hobbies, their career aspirations, all their worldly possessions are now meaningless. Um, it serves as a humbling reminder about what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and, ver moths and vermins destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It's got a double meaning there. It's not just simply about your possessions. It's about where, where am I valuing my time? Where am I putting my desires? Is it here on earth or is it in things of heaven? And for these people, clearly, they, um, they chose the things of earth. But they're going to be more concerned with that. Every, uh, everything in this world, every uh, possession that we have, every dollar to our name will someday be gone. And we'll talk about um, the importance of uh, stewardship. We're going to begin a message series this morning on that. But this kind of drives home the point and, and kind of um, helps, uh, helps on that. If our time and our effort and our resources are devoted to earthly things and simply acquiring material possessions, we're going to be pretty disappointed one day. Because you can't, like the old saying goes, you can't take it to the grave, right? Um, these people in Revelation find themselves hiding in caves, which is kind of funny because in ancient times, caves served as places of retreat and a kind of a refuge. Think about David when he hid amongst the caves when Saul was chasing after him. And yet, they're so distraught with everything happen happening to them that they're calling out to the rocks and the mountains in a place of refuge, saying, follow on us, try to hide us from the land. Uh, but yet they turn around and say, well, who can endure it? You know, they're trying, they're trying, we're going to run into this place of refuge. Um, again, trying on their own to do something. I'm going to go to where I think the refuge is. Fought, we need the rocks and the mountains to fall on us. <sighs> Who can endure it, though? It's all for naught, because it's not going to work. Um, at this point, we've covered six of the seven seals holding the scroll. Um, covered quite a lot of ground, and um, it's no doubt complicated, very intricate. Um, it involves both metaphor and literal events that are both awe-inspiring and intimidating. In everything that we've covered, I'd like to again remind us that the end times events should not be viewed as the result of a relentless, vengeful, hateful God. Just smiting people for, you know, just, just because it feels like it. We should see judgment as a holy act of justice on an unrepentant people. Every time throughout Scripture that you see God's judgment being poured out, it was summoned by the people's hard-heartedness. I mentioned this before in a sermon not terribly long ago, but there is a difference between sin and iniquity, right? We should understand that, you know, and, and people get so worried uh, because they're like, Oh man, is all this stuff going to happen to me? You know, I, I, I'm a, I, I feel like I'm a believer. I put my faith in Christ. I've given my heart over to Him. But oh, they, get, they still get worried. Is, is this going to be me someday? Where this is affecting me, me and that, you know, all these, this judgment ultimately is not going to fall on me because of stuff I've done in the past. 
Sin breaks our relationship of connection, or relationship connection with God. It's serious. We need to take it seriously, right? But there's still the possibility that our hearts are sensitive to what we've done. We, we're going into uh, Revelation with these seals, um, and especially with the, the sixth one here. What you see is a people in iniquity, being punished, not just for what they've done, but being persistent in it, hard-hearted, their arms folded up like, yeah, well, this is what we're doing, and this is the way it's going to be, period. And that's the that's where this end judgment is being referred to, or re, um, reserved for, I should say. It's for the people, a persistent, desensitized, cold heart that says, Lord, we don't care. We're going to do our own thing. And so for question three here, um, what happens when sin becomes cold and we become desensitized to it? The Holy Spirit is knocking on our heart, trying to get to us, and we don't care. That's iniquity. That's when somebody is just so in their own way of doing things that God's reaching out to them, he's reaching out to them, he's reaching out to them, and they're saying, this is my life. I want to do what I want to do. So, kind of going back to what I was talking about here, and I'm going to conclude on this note. Um, if that is you, and maybe you've always kind of worried, or you could, and believe it or not, this is a more popular fear than I think some people like to admit, um, is this stuff, you know, is this final judgment referred to, uh, being reserved for somebody like me, you know, it is, you know, am I truly saved? If you wanted to boil it down, am I truly saved? If you confess that with uh, your mouth that he's your savior, scripture says, and you believe in your heart, then you're saved. We don't, we, we got to be careful, careful, careful not to get a works mentality where it's about what we've done. Because it's not about what we've done. The only thing that we need to do is just say, Lord, I surrender. I'm raising my white flag and I'm giving my heart over to you. When you do that and you walk that out and you believe that you, you, you're doing that, that's what matters. And that's not what these people being prophesied are doing. They are a complete opposite end of the spectrum here. So um, don't uh, don't worry. I, like I said, believe it or not, that's that's a fear that uh, some people have. Um, am I truly saved? You've given your heart over to him. You've confessed him as your savior. He's, he's king. And that salvation is only available through Christ Jesus. That's it. End of story. All right. Um, as we wrap up chapter 6 here, um, let's not forget that as, as scary and as, um, as worrying as some of these things can be, the king still sits on the throne. In all that happens from the very first moment of time to the very end of time, he's still a king, and we can take our rest and our trust in him that Although things change, things get kind of crazy, and we worry about what the future might hold, um, what gives me such great comfort is that I can take a step back and say, I'm not the one that's in charge of it all. He is. And I'm just going to let it into his hands and just leave it there. So I'm not going to worry about what's coming, because to those who this matters to the most, those are the guys that really need to be worried. Those are the guys that need to get out of their iniquity and to repent, all right? Um, but... I'm not going to. I'm not going to worry about um, what the future holds because I know who holds the future. All right. Let's um, go ahead and wrap up here in a word of prayer, and that'll be the end of chapter six. We'll get into chapter seven next week. Father God, I thank you um, again for for who you are, God, your goodness to us and your faithfulness, Lord. You are just. You are holy, and that you love us, Lord, with a love that sometimes is so hard to understand, God, but. It is overwhelming. It's life-changing, God. And I just pray for your blessings on everyone here this morning, Lord. And I pray that you be with us as we go about our uh, the rest of our Sunday. In Jesus' name, amen.